Hebrews chapter 2, verse 1. When you have it, say amen. We must pay the most careful attention, therefore, to what we have what? Heard. Preaching, teaching. So pay attention. That's what the Bible is saying. Let's pay close attention to therefore what we have heard so that we do not what? Drift away. Repeat after me. Your word is written in my mind. Your word is hidden in my heart. Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light for my path. I will seek you with all my strength. I choose to live my life according to your word. Your word, O oh Lord, is eternal. Amen. You may be seated this morning. As you're taking notes, the title of this sermon, and those that are listening to me, Signs of Drift. A Russian cruise ship called the Olova was launched in 1976 to explore the Antarctica waters in 1976. It was considered one of the strongest ship. Had a thick hull to withstand the impact of a massive iceberg. The ship was named for a popular film star. After more than three decades, however, the ship lost its usefulness. When harbor fees went unpaid in Newfoundland, a salvage contractor paid $250,000 that was owed. Two years later, a Caribbean company bought it and hired Transport Canada to tow the now disgraced Olova to a scrapyard in the Dominican Republic. True story. On the way south in the Atlantic Ocean, the tow line broke and the ship drifted away. The towing barge lost contact and Transport Canada was unwilling to spend the money to search for it. They were convinced that the currents would take the ship into the vast Atlantic Ocean, far away from Canada and the United States. Months later, the U.S. satellites showed that the abandoned ship was about 1,300 nautical miles off the west coast of Ireland. It was still drifting eastward and the current. After that, the ship disappeared. The Irish government tried to locate what's called now the ghost ship. But the Olova never made it into the territory waters of Ireland. Still later, two signals were picked up, probably from lifeboats that have fallen into the water. But by that time, no one cared about the Olova. Most authorities presume that this abandoned ship now has sunk into the Atlantic Ocean. But no one really knows. And simply, it just vanished. It just drifted away. This ship that I'm talking about here today is our natural tendency is to break away from the things of God. Our natural tendency as human beings is to drift away from the things of God. Watch this. A student mind drifts from the teacher's lecture. A spouse heart drifts away during times of boredom or tension in the marriage. A driver drifts into the next lane when they're daydreaming. You know, I had a 10-year-old car and recently my 10-year-old car broke down and I had to get another car. And this car, the new car, now tells me when I'm drifting. I didn't know I had all the bells and whistles, but it'll tell you once you're going off the lane, it goes beep, 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 beep. My wife is like, how do you turn this thing off? I don't know. I just got to be on this thing, but I found out a way to turn it off. And many of us have drifted. A believer's heart drifts when he's angry. 
and assumes that God isn't on his throne any longer. Watch this. Hey, New Life, we have gone. Our, our culture is drifting. I don't know if you're noticing that. Our culture seems to be drifting away. We all see it, and we all have mixed emotions about what we're seeing on the news. We're afraid. We're concerned. We're saddened by the drift in our culture. Some of us might even care personally, but others don't even care. But when you look around, many Americans are afraid for their security that is slipping away. Watch this. It's not only across this nation, but it's also in the church. You can have a conversation here today with different people in the church this morning at the 8.30 service, and you will have different views on world politics, social welfare, immigration, and you will get different response from different people. The church of Jesus Christ is divided in their own political views. I just want to tell you that it was never like that. In the past, what you and I are experiencing today is unprecedented. This entire spectrum of belief, just in this room alone, has drifted away. I'm just giving you the survey. Don't re send me an email. Don't send me nothing. I'm just giving you a survey. Recent survey by the both Gallup and Barna Group revealed disturbing shifts in our culture. In the span of a few years, in the United States, four out of ten Americans cite worries over the loss of religious freedom. In just a few years, the number of Americans who support same-sex marriage has risen from 27% to 60% in just a few years. Based on a set of 15 beliefs of behaviors, 44% Americans can be described as post-Christians. In frustration, 7 out of 10 Americans today want political leaders who have a clear, bold stance on issue that concerns them. Of those who responded, this criteria for leadership is more important than character or political experience. In this survey was found that many women feel isolated and vulnerable. Only 17% of the women report that they feel very supported by their faith community. Consequently, many feel relationally distant from other believers. You hear me? That, in other words, that you come to church and you leave. You get your fix and you leave. But you're really not building kononia. You're not really building relationship. And I'm just trying to tell you that if you're going to survive in this storm that we're in, we need each other. You just can't walk in and out and not have relationship. Get into one of the 130 ministries. Are you with me? Now, this whole thing about drifting, it's ironic. It's ironic. But you and I, we've never... Notice that you can drift upstream. Marinate on that for a moment. Going upstream takes effort. Going forward takes effort. You say, well, Pastor Choco, what do you, not, what do you need to do? You must row, row, row your boat. Amen. Amen. But you never drift upstream. And if you allow yourself in your Christian walk, in your faith, you will be drifted away with culture. Watch this. You will never, you never drift upstream and you never drift against the tide. So you must roll your faith. If you're going to grow in the things of God, you're going to have to roll your faith. No matter how much is the current, even if you're the only one going this way, you keep rowing your boat. He said, well, Pastor Choco, what's the remedy for not drifting? I don't know. Here's a couple of things. What's the remedy for not drifting? Keep rowing. Turn to your neighbor and say, you got to keep rowing. <laughs> you got to keep rowing your boat. The moment you stop rowing your boat, your Christian life, you'll begin to go with the current of society. And you begin to drift and you fall in line with culture. Another remedy for not drifting is watching the undercurrent. 
Now, I don't know about you, but I was not always savvy about undercurrent. When you go to the beach and you would say, be careful for undercurrent. Well, let me just explain to you what undercurrent means. That the water can be going this way on the surface, but on the bottom of this, there's another current that's happening that's going opposite. That can take you. Did you follow me? You could see with your eyes the current going this way, but under the current you cannot see. If you're not careful, temptation that you do not see takes you with you. Hey, let me just tell you here this morning that drifting away from the things of God is not something that's so sudden. It's very subtle. Drifting away. How did we get here? How did we get here, Pastor Choco? How did we get in this drifting concept? Let me just give you a couple of things. The young adults have grown up during the time of a rapid culture change but those those shifts began long before they were even born the young people older americans have witnessed a series of events that have led us to this point the prosperity of the post world world war ii years created a tsunami of change as memories of the great depression and the war quickly faded away in the rearview mirror in the new rules Daniel writes, he describes how our culture had moved from self-sacrifice before and during the World War II to self-indulgence self indulgence in the decades after the war. During the World War II, we were a society that was self-sacrifice, but after the war, we become a society that's self-indulgence. People were deprived for a long time and suddenly they had the opportunity to have it all in the 1980s. There was a boom of prosperity. Modern advertisement made it a big promise. Look at the advertisements. You remember back in the day, at least when I remembered, the, 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 the advertisement in the news were just so simple. It was just a piece of paper. Even the weather. But advertisement has changed even itself. Before ads simply described how a product can serve you. But today, this advertisement today makes promises. Beer commercials, bank commercials, car commercials make promises, benefits of popularity, financial security, close friendship, peace, freedom, sexual attraction. If you have these things, advertisements are promising things that you would have. Before in the 50s and the 60s and 70s, the advertisement was what it can serve you. But now the advertisement is coming with the promise. If you buy this, you would be popular. You would be sexy. Over-promising, over overpromising became completely normal in our society. With increased income in the 80s and the 70s and popularity and prosperity, parents had enough money for their children to go to college. Watch this. Until that point, our nation's history, the vast majority of young people received at best a high school education. And then when they finished high school, they would go work in the farms with their family members. They never thought about leaving their house and going to another state and get education. It was unheard of until the boom of prosperity. Geographically, that a young woman or a young man would leave the family structure and go to another state and learn. And then when they do that, all hell breaks loose. New lifestyles happen. No longer do you have the grandparents and the parents giving wisdom to that child. School, high school student graduates, now they have this opportunity to go away from home, move away from home, what that brought them, their, 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 their faith in God. Now they feel freedom from their parents. And they experiment and lifestyle choices that they would have never dreamed of had they been with mom and grandpa. I just try to tell you there has been a shift in our society. 
And there's four responses that happens to this shift, this drift that we're experiencing. Four responses. Let me give it to you here today. Number one, we accommodate. Accommodators look at the shift in attitudes toward gay marriage or guns or immigration, the use of force by police or any other important cultural change, and they say, well, it's no big deal. Pastor Choker, is no big deal. Everyone deserves a fair treatment. And besides, this is a big one. Watch this. No one is right to judge anybody. So they accommodate whatever is happening in the culture. That's what they want to do. So this is one of the things, one of the four things that happens. Number one, accommodate. Number two, another response to this cultural shift is oppose. These people oppose change because they're terrified by the way of life is going to be taking them away. Or worse, it has already been stolen from them. They only listen to friends or commentators who reinforce their fears, their fears and inflame their anger. So when you see the culture shape, the, the drifting away, one thing is to accommodate it. Another thing is perhaps oppose it. Another way is to withdraw from it. These people who are withdrawing away from what they're seeing in the culture, this group assumes, what's the use? My voice means nothing in the big debates about immigration, gun control, racial conflict, same-sex marriage. What's the use, Pastor Choco? I don't even watch the news anymore. I don't want to get in the line of fire between people who are angry. So what I do? I withdraw. These are some of the responses. But here's the response. Now, these responses, they're, you know, for me, they're wrong responses. These three responses to culture shift may seem completely good and right, but they undermine our identity as strong, compassionate, wise children of our heavenly king. For instance, those who accommodate change Lose the truth. If you start accommodating change, then you have lost the truth of the Bible. Behaviors that were called sin in a generation ago become acceptable behaviors today. Today we don't call it sin, we call it behaviors. Just saying. Those who oppose change can lose their sense of grace, love, and mercy for those who disagree with them. And those who withdraw too quickly lose their God-given opportunities to represent Him in a lost and confused world. So what's the answer, Pastor Choco? You must engage. Number four, you must engage. Jesus calls us to be in the world, but not of the world. Did you hear me? He calls you and I to be in the world, but not of the world. When the New York Times called me and they asked me about the same-sex marriage law of the Supreme Court, I told them that the, the Church of Jesus Christ has always been at odds with culture. And we're going to continue to be the church that offers transformation and love towards people. We're going to engage the marginalized. We're going to engage the lepers. We're going to do what Jesus did. He wept with those who had lost loved ones. He, 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 he felt genuine sorrow when others had different paths. He stood up against injustice. And he boldly faced the religious leaders who despised him for loving the unlovable. We're in the world, but not of the world. We're to be salt and light to the people around us. With this identity, look at me, with this identity in perspective... With people of truth and grace, in our engagement with people, you and I follow the example of Jesus. I'm not afraid of anybody. I don't care if you got leprosy. I don't care if you're sick. I don't care if you got AIDS. I don't care who you are, whether you're black, white, Hispanic. I have no problem. I want to be Jesus to you. Whether you're straight or gay, you're lost. I don't care. I'm going to engage you like Jesus engaged you. Watch this. I believe God wants me, God wants you to engage the demanding people and the difficult issues in our culture. 
most people, including many Christians, are putting their hopes on an earthly kingdom. You hear me? Our hope is not in an earthly kingdom. Our hope is in a heavenly kingdom. N.T. Wright, who's a New Testament scholar, Anglican bishop, he wrote this. And he observes that Jesus came just as he predicted, but not at all as people expected. He writes this. People, that's you and I, they were looking for a builder to construct the home that they thought they wanted. But he was the architect. He's not coming to build your house with your plans. He has a plan. He comes to planet earth and he says, I I have a plan for you. And then you pull out, you say, well, I have already a plan. Don't worry, put that away. He didn't come to construct your house, how you planned it. Because he says, I have a plan. And this plan is to bless you. This plan is to prosper you. N.T. Wright says this. They were looking for a singer to sing the song that they had been humming for a long time. But he was the composer bringing them a new song. Listen, church. He's, he's the composer. And he, when he came, he says, I have a new song for you to sing. But they've been humming a song for 400 years. Thousands of years. He's not coming to sing your song. He is the composer who has written the song that he wants you to sing. I know culture is shifting and I know that people want to do what they want to do. But God says, I have a plan. I have a song. And you've lost your identity. And for those who are watching across this nation, we cannot lose our identity, who we are in Christ. There must be clear identity with compelling purpose. Watch this. First, we must know who we are. We must not define ourselves as this world defines us. Or be swayed by the latest, the latest fade and trends. You and I must have a clear identity and a compelling purpose. What do we do, Pastor Choco? You got to have a clear identity. Who are you? When God, look at me, when God pulled the people of Israel out of Egypt and they were there for 400 years, he takes them out of that mess, Rosa. He takes them out of that mess because they were living in chaos for 400 years. And then he takes them to Mount Sinai. And you know what he does immediately? He gives them identity. Because what happens, look at me, what happens when people don't have clear identity? They normally drift back to what they used to be. When you don't know who you are, when you don't know who you're serving, the tendency is, I'm drifting in this culture, and I'm lost in this wandering experience, right? Because God took them out of Egypt, and he takes them into the wilderness, and it was very important for God to give them clear identity. You are my people. I'm going to give you laws, and I'm going to give you love, because you lived for 400 years in chaos. That's what happens. Can you imagine two million plus people coming out into the wilderness with no laws and no love? They go wandering. They start drifting in the desert. And they die. Because people who are in chaos start drifting. Watch this. He takes them out of Egypt. He brings them to Mount Sinai. He gives them the law immediately. You all need laws to to function, to have structure in your life, to have parameters in your life. God had to remove them from their crisis to a location where he can speak to them one-on-one and give them clear identity, who they were, who they belonged to, what was their purpose in life. When you don't know your purpose in life, you drift I don't know if I'm coming, I'm going. I'm going to church. I'm not sure. I'm not going. Am I serving? I'm not serving. When you don't know who you are. But remember, those who drift never drift upstream. 
Because to go upstream, you must row, row, row your boat. Because the tendency is to drift back to where you were before. When there's no clear identity in your life, you start drifting. That's why it's important that you have an identity in Christ and your purpose. Some of you here today, you have found your, you found Christ and your identity is in Christ. I'm a new creature. I'm a new person. I have destiny in front of me. Nothing can separate me from the love of Christ. Nor famine, nor nakedness, nor sword, no culture that's drifting can separate me from the love of Christ. That's why clear identity is crucial. It's important to establish your identity this morning so that you don't begin to drift in your faith or to return where you used to swim in the pool of blood. How you handle opposition and persecution when it comes your way. What are you going to do? Because being a Christian is hard. There's a lot of inconveniences. Look at, look at what the Apostle Paul wrote in the first century church to the Christians. He says this, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, he says, But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show all this all oh, surpassing power is from God and not from us. We are hard pressed on every side, not crushed, perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted. But not abandoned. Struck down. Oh, I wish I could get a witness here today. Struck down, but not destroyed. We've always carried around in our body the death of Jesus. So that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. He says in Acts chapter 20 verse 24. I consider my life worth nothing to me. My only aim is to finish the race and complete the task that the Lord Jesus has given me. The task of testifying to the good news of God's grace. Watch this. Stand with me. Stand with me. Stand with me. Stand with me. This culture is drifting. But the church of Jesus Christ will not drift. Some of you all here today. You've drifted in your faith. You've accommodated. Or you've opposed it. Or you've withdrawn from it and said, that's not my problem. I'm trying to tell you as your pastor, engage it. Don't be afraid. Love on people who look different than you, act different than you, walk different than you. That's not going to change my conviction. If I sit down with a Muslim or someone who's gay or straight, that's not going to change my conviction. I know who I am in Christ Jesus. I know that I've been re redeemed. I know that I've been saved. But if you and I are not careful, because drifting is subtle. Pastor Choco, what are some of the signs that I've drifted in my spiritual walk? You don't pray as often. You don't pray. You go days without praying. You've drifted, my friend. What's another sign? You don't even read the Bible anymore. You hold on to scripture that you've memorized for years. You've drifted. story of a two young boys, two young men who are fishing above the, a low dam on a river in their hometown. True story. As they were concentrating on catching fish, they were unaware that they had drifted until they were far from the water flowing over the dam. When they realized their situation that they were by the dam, the current near the dam that had become too powerful for them to keep the boat going forward and the dam was taking them in. The boat flipped over. Two boys went under the dam through the crevices in the rocks, boulders that were waiting for them. Caught at the bottom by the swirling of the waters under the rocks, the two boys never came back to surface. After days of relentless searching, the divers finally found one body. 
Then three days later, they found the other body. We're in our boats. You're in your life. And you're out there doing worldly stuff and earthly pleasures. And you're not even noticing that your life is being taken into the dam. You're not even worried about where you're at spiritually. But little do you know, you're about to go over the dam. Because you're all into the earthly kingdom. I told you last week, I am not from this world. I'm here for a little while. Set your sights on the heavenly kingdom. Come on, somebody. You and I are in this place for a little while. But while we're in this world, Keep rowing your boat. You may be the only one in your family going upstream. But I am not going to accommodate. I'm not going to oppose it. I'm not going to withdraw myself from it. I'm going to engage it. Because I know my Redeemer lives. I know He lives. With every head bowed and every eyes closed. He's come with His plans. He is the architect. He's come with his plans. He's got a song that he's written for you. And yet you tell him, I have my own song. He says, I got these architectural plans. And I want to build this life for you. But you've rejected my plans. And you're about to go over the dam. You're drifting with culture. It's not too late. It's not too late.